Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Parshas Nitzavim. Parshas Nitzavim is always, you know, before Rosh Hashanah. Natem Nitzavim, all standing before Hakadosh Baruch Hu. At Asher Yishnoi Tano Ayom, Asher Yishnoi Tano Ayom, everybody. So while we are standing uh, before Kaddish Baruch Hu for Rosh Hashanah, let's take a look at Sipur Yamaisius and um, see what it is that we have to contend with. Just uh, here we go. So, let me just make it a little bit bigger so you guys can see it easier, whoever it is. Well, it's a little bit too big. Okay, anyhow. So, we told the story so far. The Viceroy went through whatever he went through. He found the... Uh, the princess, the, the the king's daughter, and they he had a, a whole a couple of episodes of trying to get her out of the place of the no good, and um, he managed to fail twice. And then we said that uh, the the daughter of the the princess came in a in a wagon in a carriage, and she saw him, and she shouted as a great pity on him and me, and so forth and so on, because every time that he failed, he fell asleep, and we mentioned that falling asleep is analogous to falling away from certain facets of the term. And when he finally woke, we said a few things about the fact that even though he failed, by her passing next to him, is telling you that the effort that he put in was not in vain. Because he got her out and we said if he spoke he slept for 70 years which means that he fell off Torah completely uh, and his servant which is the Seichel could not could not wake him Yeshina tried to wake him she could not wake him she cried and he says afterward he awoke and he asked the attendant where am I in the world which comes to tell you that the same way that even though measuring by results he actually failed, he succeeded because he put the work in. The same thing now, the fact that the Shekhinah cries over him, that enables him to awake. And the first question that he asks is a tennis, the first question that each and every one of us has to ask himself. Where am I in the world? Where am I in the world? What's, what's, what's up, what's down, what's left, what's right, what's right, what's wrong? Now, you may be able to do something about it. You may not be able to do anything about it. You may be able to do a little bit about it or a lot about it, but when you're asking, where am I in the world? It already puts you in the right picture, in the right perspective. That's what you need. Especially when you're connected to tzaddik. We'll talk about this a bit later. So the servant told him how everything, the soldiers went and the, the princess and she cried and so on. He saw the scarf which she wrote, her lamentation, with tears 
And he asked, who is this from? The Sechel said, you know, she wrote it, and the Shechina wrote it, this is the term. And he lifts it up, he looks at his car, raises it against the sun, and he began to see the letters. It's only when you learn Torah, and you put it vis-a-vis the light of the Seichel, which is the sun, the Rebbein says in Torah Aleph, you're able to see the letters, you're able to see what what is the Chacham, what is the message that the Torah is actually trying to give you. And because you can, you know, you can read, you can quote all kinds of psukim from the Torah, and they, you know, you're still off base. You can even learn Torah, and you're still not where it's at. You have to look, you have to look at the Torah looking for the Seichel. Shebechol Dava. This is how you'll be able to find it. And now she tells him that she's no longer in the castle. He should search for a golden mountain, a pearl castle. There you will find me. So, last we said he left the, the, the Eternal behind and he went alone to seek her. Which means now, even the Seichel is not going to help you. The one thing that you need is a Muna. And he went and he sought her for many years. You know, it was something that takes toil. And he decided in a subtle area that cannot be a golden mountain and pearl castle, because he was an expert in the world map. Therefore, I will go in the desert. And he went searching for her in the desert for many years. The same thing that happened in the very beginning, that's how he found her in the place of the Sitra Akhra. It followed the same kind of route. He was searching for a long time, and obviously he was searching in popular area, which means he was searching in the well-trodden paths that all, uh, you know, from Eden go at. They, they follow those paths. Um, you know, the, it's Boch Hashem is going to show and it's learning Torah and, you know, just but a certain kind of a, it's a grooved kind of thing. It's a grooved kind of experience. Everybody goes to shul, everybody learns Torah, whatever it is, but it's, and it's, it's sort of a communal experience. It's like a, um, almost like, it's very important, but almost like a club where, you know, you belong to a society and the fact that you belong to a society keeps you on the, on the straight and narrow path, uh, which is extremely, extremely important, including the Levush and everything else. And, um, but when you're looking for a golden mountain in a castle made of, pearl, made of pearls, a pearl castle, you're talking about the highest level, highest level of 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 Yira and Ahava. Because you're talking about golden mountain, gold, the color of gold is red. It represents the Yira. And the pearl is white, it represents the Ahava. So now when he's looking for the Shekhinah, he's looking for very, very exalted levels. And she tells him, this is where you're found. And he leaves the Seichel alone, and he goes he, he goes in the well-trodden path, and he can't find it. And he realizes he has to go to the desert. He has to go to a place where he is. he has to find his own way. And the way that he finds his own way is by talking to Yokodesh Baruch Hu. It's Midbar, Midbar Nishwam Midgaber. He has to go and speak to Yokodesh Baruch Hu. And he has to do it for a long while. Now comes the next stage of this particular adventure. Afterwards, he noticed a very large man whose largest was beyond human bounds. And he was carrying a large tree, so large that in a subtle area, such a large tree would not exist. And he, the viceroy, asked him, who are you? I'm sorry. He asked the viceroy, who are you? So the Vassar answered to him, I'm a man. 
And he, you know, that giant was amazed. He said, I've been in this wilderness for such a long time. I've never seen a man. So he told him the whole story, as mentioned above, that he was looking for a golden mountain and a pearl castle. And that large person replied to him, it certainly does not exist. He dissuaded him and said to him, they have convinced you with nonsense, because it certainly does not exist. So he, the viceroy, started to weep very much. Now the viceroy cried very much and said, with certainty it does exist in some place. But he, which means the giant dissuaded him, certainly they have convinced you with nonsense. And, and he, the viceroy, said, it certainly it exists somewhere. So the large person told him, in my opinion, it is nonsense. Now because you are so stubborn, look, I'm the appointee over all the animals. So I will act for your sake and summon all the animals. Since they run all over the world, maybe one of them will know of that mountain and castle. And he summoned all the animals from small to large, all sorts of animals, and asked them. They all answered they had not seen. And he said to him, see, they all, they, 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 they've talked nonsense into you. Now, if you want to listen to me, just turn back, because suddenly you will not find him. He does not exist in the world. But he, the viceroy, pressed him very much. He says, it must surely indeed be. So he, you know, this, this giant said to him, look, I have a brother in the wilderness. And he's the appointee over all the birds. Maybe they will know, since they fly high in the air. Maybe they've seen a mountain in the castle. Go to him and tell him, I've sent you to him. The story continues where he meets another giant, the brother of the first one, who is in charge of all the birds, who can fly everywhere. And then he afterwards... Uh, introduces and sends him over he tells him the same thing dissuades him you know this is nonsense it never happened and he tells him he has an okay so he said if you saw such a stubborn it's an action okay for i have another brother who is in charge of all the spirits and all the winds so i'll send you to him and he went to him and same thing happened and then you know this is where the the, the 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 chink in the armor is found. These people, these people, these giant, these beings. So Ben says it's not, it's not, it's not human for somebody to be so big. And the fact that they are carrying a tree, each one is carrying this big tree on his shoulder. The tree is a symbol of wisdom. And the tree is so big that there is no such tree in, 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 in inhabited areas. Which means they have wisdom which is way beyond that of normal, normal human beings. Who are they? Who are these giants? On one hand, you can say that, you know, the one that, that represents all the animals uh, are the, you know, the, the, the scientists. You know, they try to bring riots from the world of science. And um, they come and they say, it doesn't exist. The second one that is the appointee of all the birds, you know, he's the, the philosophers, the, the, the mind fly all over the place, the thinking deeply into things. And they also tell him there's no such thing. The third one is the appointee on all the spirits and all the winds. He represents the spiritual people, the great spiritual people. 
You've been great rabbis. To the point that they're beyond mere mortal dimensions. And now they're all dissuading him. We had such an uh, episode happening to us already before. It happened when the Meraglim was sent to Eretz Yisrael. And they, they went to Shechem and they saw the giants there. And those giants say, did you see those little, you know, ants, you know, that look like people? And the Miraglim went back, and this is what they told Amishra. Who were those giants? Those giants were the offsprings of the angels that told the Kaddish Baruch not to create man, because men will not be able to, to hack it in this world. So, the Kodesh Baruch asked them, men will be able to hack it. What about you? You think you'll be able to hack it? He said, of course. Malachi. He says, okay. And he sent them down. It says in, you know, in Bereshis, V'noyach, V'yeru b'nei ha'elokim es nos ha'odom, the children the children of, of Hashem saw the daughters of men and they liked them and they took them. Doesn't matter if they were married or not married, whatever it is. These huge angels came down this world and crashed in the reality of, of, of our reality. They weren't able to hack it. The problem with the Miraglim, you know, these are the people who always tell you, eh, you know, you're not going to make it. Forget about it. Who the heck do you think you are? Khan Kanevsky, you know, who, who do you think you are, you know? You're the son of the, the I don't know, of the stipler, you're the son of the, who knows? Who, who, who do you think you are? You know, you're just a simple person. And, and the problem of the Miraglim was not what these people say. The head of the Miraglim, which is the thing here that the Viceroy does not fall into, was the fact that the Miraglim believed those giants. And he, they, they believed them. We're just like ants. We, we can never do this. There's no way that we can do it. To the point, they were so convinced of it, to the point where They came to believe that Kaviyochel, even a Kodesh Baruch Hu, cannot win against these giants. When you get demoralized, when you get convinced that Yiddishkeit is so lofty, and 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 the goals of being a real Oyvind Hashem is just so immense. For what you're looking, you're looking for a golden mountain, a pearl, the castle of pearl. Uh, they listen, you know, these breast lovers, you know, the hockey in China, they tell you, you listen, you can and you will, with the koyach of the tzaddik, even you can. 
And Rabbeinu explains that with the koyach of the tzaddik, that means that means that the tzaddik has the koyach, Rabbeinu says, that the tzaddik has the koyach of Eretz Yisrael. Eretz Yisrael has Eretz Ochel Yishveh. A land that consumes its inhabitants. This is what the Maragdim said. He said it's a land that consumes its inhabitants. And Rabbeinu takes that very Pasuk, which when you look at the Pshat of this Pasuk, it means it's a land that, that, that kills Chas Khalil and those who live there. And Rabbeinu turns it over and he says, what is Eretz? Eretz is Emunah. And it says, Shechon Eretz or Emunah. We reside in the land and, and shepherd the Emunah, make the Emunah grow. Eretz is so is different than all the other lands in the world only because we believe. That's it. The land, the earth looks the same. You can probably grow better grapes in 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 Burgundy or or whatever, and there are more stunning mountains in in Switzerland or I don't know. The main mile of Eretz Yisrael is a moon. And when it says Eretz Ochelis Yashvea means that, that this land is auspicious to Amuna. If you want to. If you want to get Amuna, Eretz Yashvea consumes you. You become one shtickle piece of Amuna. The tzaddik has the same koyach. But it means you have to want to. If you don't want to be consumed by Eretz Yashvea, you don't want to be consumed by the Emuna, if you don't want to be consumed by the Tzaddik, because Baruch Hu said, this land, you know, of anybody who behaves, you know, with hanky panky does not mean ultimately the land just, just, just chucks them up, you know, just throws, it throws, it throws them out, you know, just throws them out. Same thing with the Tzaddik, but when you believe in the Tzaddik, and the tzaddik says, you know, if you just, if you want to, does not say if you are matzliach, but if you want to, the tzaddik already fix you. Rabbeinu promised, you know, there's another sikha that Rabbeinu speaks about Um, escape me for a minute. And Rabbeinu s- speaks about the idea that the tzaddik could, very, you know, by us, the the mind. And, you know, the good and the bad is mixed together. Which, he says, you know, it is possible to actually separate them in one shot. But that means that part of, of the, the, the das, of the brain, being that it's so mixed up with the schmutz, with the, uh, will, you know, will will be taken away. So what happens, what, what has to be is that, it says it's like boiling water, you know, when you're boiling water that the impurities come to the surface, and somebody has to come and just, you know, and scoop it off. You know, and especially, you know, Israel Simcha is a, is a fantastic cook, so you know when you, when you cook, uh, let's say, chickpeas, right, when you boil them for a while, so this this scum that comes to the surface, and you have to you have to scoop it off and take it off. This is you know that, uh, and slowly, slowly, you know the the brain cleans out, and only the good remains. So it doesn't happen in a minute. 
And it doesn't happen in a day. But it does definitely happen in a lifetime. In the previous generations, when there was this, this big breath of the Chosid that suffered tremendous Yisurim. And he was, you know, really a great man. So the people asked him, you know, what's the, you're coming, you're coming to Rabbeinu, and you know, look what you're going through. So he told him, do you know who I am? Do you know what I went through? And he told him, he was a really great man. He wasn't somebody, you know, with the Mionis. And he said, he already came into this world in a few incarnations. And he went to the Tzadik door in those generations and asked him to, to fix him, and they couldn't. And he says, he came into this incarnation, he came to Rabbeinu, and Rabbeinu fixes him completely. As long as you don't let the giants bring you down, as you don't let these malachim to tell you, you, come on, be realistic. It's too late. You're too old. You're too young. You're not intelligent enough. You can't learn. You can't learn. You can't dive in. You can't dive in. And all those things that are all those reasons why you should turn around and go back home. Meaning, spend your time in this world chasing a juicier, more marbleized steak, you know, a more fragrant cigar and a more expensive bottle of wine. That's it. Don't believe them. So when this giant came and told him, there's no such thing. The, the the viceroy starts to cry. In other words, the answer is not arguing. You could have told them the whole story. You know, I went and I came to the to the to the house of the, the place of the not good and the Shrina and I went and I came back and I went and came back and the king sent me. He could have said everything. But he didn't. He just said, Listen, this is what I'm looking for. So he says, there's no such thing. It comes to teacher, Rabbeinu says, do not get into arguments with your Yitzhahar. Don't go explaining back and forth. Don't go explaining back and forth. I know there is. I know that definitely is. Means I know that I belong in a void of Hashem that reaches the level of a mountain of gold in a pearl of castle. Of such incredible Yira and such incredible Ahava that the Malachim cannot imagine it. And as a result, they're just breaking you down, just telling you, listen, this, you know, you're just kidding yourself, forget about it. So much depends and rests on Amuna, on being stubborn, on saying, I do not live in vain. I do not live for settling. Well, okay, that's good enough. No, 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 no. That's not what I was born for. I'm living in order to serve a Kaddish Baruch and get close to him on the highest possible level. Ah, my own 
you know, tests and, and, and evidence, you know, of my of my uh, of my travels and and, and 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 toil and whatever it is, is is poor at best. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I know there is, I know there is a mountain of gold in a peril castle. I know, I know. If you convince me there isn't, so I'll start to cry. But I know there is. I know there is. And when you are emphatically stubborn and strong in your emuno, that force, that giant, that obstacle becomes your step to the next step. That giant is leading you to his brother. He is the one who is in charge of physicality. He is leading him to his brother in charge of, 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 of thinking, of thought. Of Chochmah, of Das. Whenever it is that you are standing fast before the obstacles, if you are strong, you'll be Matzliach. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. So it doesn't make sense. But I know there is. Zat Hashem HaShoshona is next week. Atem nitzavim ayom ifnei Hashem elokeichem. You take a look at yourself. I can hardly wake up in the morning. The davening is not a davening. The learning is not a learning. Whatever it is, all the evidence point that just don't bother, don't bother. But the koyach of the tzaddik, that's the reason why everybody wants to go to Uman, because the koyach of the tzaddik, it's the koyach of the tzaddik is that he, Bezat Hashem, will fix you completely. If you want to. If you want to, he will fix you completely, will get you, Bezat Hashem, a full tikkun, a complete tikkun. This lifetime is Hashem. But Hashem, Hashem will bench us all with Ksir Vachsimetoivo. But Hashem, I don't know yet if I'm going or not going, because who should help. So, obviously, you know, we'll be sending, uh, if there'll be another Shira on Thursday, I'll send you an email uh, to that effect. Uh, or in Mitzvah Hashem will be in Oman, who knows? By Kodesh Boch, everything is possible. So thank you so very much, and a really, really, really get Ben Shiro to all of us.